Okay, so welcome to the course today. We are going to continue to work on um, graph-based slam techniques and look into two aspects today. Um, the first thing is how can we deal with constraints that are not of Gaussian nature? So if we, for example, have ambiguities in our data association. Um, for example, we, the robot is currently in an environment which looks very similar to other parts of the environment, let's say, with a building with rooms which look identical. And the question is how, uh, if the robot is not able to identify in which room it exactly is, it may be helpful to relax the, um, the, the constraint that it's a Gaussian to a multimodal distribution. So when what changes if we look for multimodal constraints? That means we don't have one single Gaussian distribution modeling the error, but we have, for example, multiple Gaussians. So if we go for example for some of Gaussians. Or what happens if we have outliers in our um, data associations? That means the robot simply made an error saying this place here should be the same than the other place, but this is complete nonsense. So, um, and this is kind of important because especially the larger the environment gets, the more likely it is that our data association system will make errors. So it's very, very unlikely that we have a failure-free front end which tries to identify um, identical places. And so the question is, what tools can be employed in our optimization engine or in our error minimization in order to get rid of the, the problems that result from those outliers? So if we look to the standard least squares approach, the, the key idea is to uh, minimize the sum of the squared errors. So we have individual error terms, and we want to minimize the sum of these individual squared error terms. And we also show that this has a very strong relation to um, the uh, maximum likelihood estimation in the Gaussian case. That means if our error terms, or the error terms here, we use our quadratic error terms, and this corresponds, minimizing the error in the squared error function corresponds to um, maximizing the log likelihood in the Gaussian case. So if so the, the maximum the maximum likelihood estimate we obtain with our optimization is actually ends up to be the mean of the joint Gaussian distribution. So the problem we have here, we are actually the things I just discussed before. First, the approach is rather sensitive to outliers. So even if a small fraction of our constraints, let's say one percent of all our constraints, um, are simply wrong. So they simply relate two places which is, which, with each other which are not related just because our place recognition system or our front end simply made mistakes. So we said, ah, this looks very, very similar here. Um, that can be very problematic for us. Um, and the second thing is that the distributions we use are only Gaussian. That means they only have a single mode. So we, we, the robot is not able to model the fact that it says, it can be either here, here, or here. I know that I'm, or very, it's very unlikely that I'm somewhere else, but at the three places which look more or less identical, so I'm not sure in which of these three places I'm actually in. And um, so the, the, what we're trying to address here today is one way for dealing with this imperfect data association and with these multimodal constraints. Um, this occurs actually, uh, as I said, if places look identical, for example, if the same looking rooms in the same building or you have highly symmetric environments where it's simply very hard uh, to distinguish if this is the same place or if it's just a little bit of noise in my observations. Um, or maybe the environment, the surrounding slightly changed or the conditions under which you observe the environment slightly changed. If you use cameras, for example, to observe the environment and you are observing a place at a different time of the day, so the uh, lighting conditions may have changed it's partially quite hard to say, is this still the same place or does it not look more similar to a, to a different place we have been before. Um, the other situations where this can actually come up are cluttered scenes. So if you have high clutter or repetitive clutter and you drive with a robot using laser range scanner, it can actually be the case that multiple positions in this cluttered environment look quite similar. And the other um, situation where these things can occur is actually 
GPS multipass. So um, in these GPS signals, you typically measure the time it takes from the, from the satellite signal to reach the receiver, but especially in um, <coughs> kind of urban canyons or environments where those signals may be reflected. Um, you simply end up at wrong pose estimates. And you may have, depending on how much access to you have to your GPS data, um, you may be able to identify that these are multiple hypotheses where the robot can be. So most GPS researchers just provided the output of whatever they come up with that around internally. But some actually provide you access to the raw signal information, then you can actually generate multiple hypotheses where the robot can be. So you could also, um, also these kinds of, of sensors can have ambiguities, and um, the question is how can we deal with that? So I have one example over here. So this is a small simulated 3D world. This is a small robot observing the environment, and you have these kind of boxes here. And if you, just based on a laser range scanner, um, try to find different places where the robot can be, you get a belief that it may look like this. So it's, I think, for fixed orientation, you're just move, shifting the robot in the environment. You can actually see that you have multiple modes here. Still, there's one pretty prominent mode here, um, but you may also end up in situations where this is where this is not that um, clearly identifiable. And so in this case, you, you could model, for example, oh, the robot is either here, 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 or there. And then use this um, multimodal distribution in order to um, optimize your method. Let the optimizer figure out what the most likely explanation, given all the data we accumulated in the environment. So, so this was a simulated um, example, but these problems can also happen in reality. So if you're here at this Intel data set during a mapping run, and then if you have a robot standing over here observing the scene and over here, Actually, those two places from the raw laser scans look actually quite similar. You can here see always how the uh, map builds so far, which are the red scans, are aligned with the blue scans, which is what the robot sees at the moment. And you can see actually that um, quite some fractions of the environment give a pretty good match. Um, some of them have small errors in here, but at least the area here and the area here looks, let's say, not too difficult. Uh, not too different, sorry. Not too different. So it, it can happen that your system actually <coughs> makes, say, say these two places are exactly the same place and connect them. If you would do that, this map would be completely uh, useless for doing any navigation task. Just to illustrate that how that could look like, so if the, this is the data set where you just have one single constraint which says, hey, these are the, these are the same places, all other data sets that are correctly, all kind of these, whatever, two and a half thousand people drop across the just one wrong one. You can already see that the map is slightly bended over here. So it's still not. So you're, you're moving away from the optimal solution. In this case, you just have six, five or six um, wrong constraint, either one shown in red. I'll probably do a 10. I think that's the 10. You can actually see that, at least in this area over here, the map is completely useless for doing any navigation or localization tasks. Just having a small number of false positives. And here, I think 100, and the map is really hard at least already for us to identify the structure of the environment. So um, having outliers or committing to the wrong mode can have catastrophic failures um, and can lead to maps which are really useless for navigation. So still, you try to build your front ends in a way that they don't make any data association failures. But it's very unlikely that you will come up with a general system which makes no errors at all. So it's kind of important for being able to deal with outliers. And it's also nice to have this ability to incorporate multi constraints. So the question is, how could we um, incorporate these, uh, let's say, multimodal constraints, start with the multimodal constraints first, into our um, optimization framework? And that's actually the question I would like to address in here today. Oops, sorry for that. OK, so any idea how we could do that? Say so you want to address a multimodal case. How could we do that? What would be a straightforward solution? Um, maybe for each ambiguity, split the graph, have to look, have two mapping slam algorithms running. Mm -hmm. I mean, I realize it's probably not a smart solution, but it, it's yeah, that, that's definitely. So if you have, a, especially if you have a small number of these um, highly ambiguous situations, you say the both are like this or like that. You could actually do that. So you make a copy of your whole graph and simply run two graphs in parallel. Either this is the right data association, or the other one is the right data association. And then you continue with that, and then you need to have some measure to say, hey, uh, let's say situation A is more likely to be the right one than situation B. Maybe taking into account the overall error you obtain. That's one thing you could do. The only problem is, first, you have to track, keep track of all those data associations, and 
especially if you have multiple data stations in a sequence, this gives a pretty, let's say, strong explosion of possibilities you need to track right in the multi hypothesis a standard way of doing kind of multi hypothesis tracking for SLAM. Um, so you can do that. The problem is it gets very hard to compute um, if you have, let's say, more than two, three, four, five uh, data state decisions where you get ambiguities. This is more of the case that's, that's problematic. What would be another option? Is there any uh, possibility to do the sampling? Uh, previously, we did for some Gaussian, dis multi Gaussian distribution, we just do the sam sampling for means and then have. Different Gaussian distribution and yeah, there actually have been approaches which try to do that. Use a particle filter to kind of sample the let's say topological uh, situations or the, the the rough data associations, and then uh, based on the result of the particles do actually do the optimization step in the background and just maintain kind of a fixed number of hypotheses using these particles. This has actually been done. Um, let's say wasn't the result which everyone uses right now. So there have been a few mapping systems which do that, which actually work kind of, kind of nicely. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if they survived during the last years. Um, let's, let's say we want to stick with our optimization framework because we feel comfortable with that and we would like to just modify that so that we can actually deal with those problems. So what would be another alternative? What could we do? Um, we, so we get a new data node, right? Uh -huh. We could, if you have an ambiguity, we could make it two nodes, and then connect. Then we have two edges, so one to the one association and the other to the other. Mm -hmm. So well, you don't actually need two nodes; you could just create two edges. Uh, one is wrong, one is right. In this case, that seems dangerous because. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So perhaps elaborate your solution a little bit more, maybe I haven't fully really understood. Okay, so if you split, yeah. it's it's kind of like copying the whole graph, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So we so we have uh, the last known node where there's no ambiguity, there's ambiguity, mm -hmm. and so we have some node J and some node K, yeah. which are so we have two nodes. One has an edge constraint to node J, and the other the other node has an edge constraint to node K. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you now optimize, mm -hmm. um, what one should prevail in, in, in or you know you, you kind of make the decision keep which one survives and which one dies out. I mean, yeah, it's kind of nice because by, by the ideas which come up here, actually things which came up in the literature as well, in slightly I mean, let's say slightly modified ways, but at least. The key idea was the same. So in this case, people started to simply introduce two edges and saying, it's either this one or this one. And they simply have a variable that can flip between them and say, it's either this one, this one. And put this variable as another indicator variable to my state space and do the optimization. That's kind of. So Process like this exist and are still popular, or are popular today, but um, are one of the solutions you actually find in literature. Any other idea? The, the hierarchical structure we have previously, we just. Yeah. <coughs> Try the more sparse uh, graph related to previous one, and maybe we can drop some of those ambiguities and keep only some of them to have much smaller graph, and then do some optimization if the uncertainty. Yeah. Same as in we have in the previous lecture, we follow the same idea. I mean. So. The problem you have if you do that is in order to generate those edges for the higher levels, you need to do the optimization locally in the lower level. And if you have um, if the wrong constraints in there or committed to the wrong mode, your constraints on the higher level will be wrong. So it's not at least not directly clear to me how that could work. Those ambiguities have some uh, probability. They are they have some we are more certain about some of them, more uncertain about some the yeah. others. Maybe we just keep those ambiguities. We are more certain about them, and we have more prior value about them, and keep them in the higher level graph and try to continue with them instead of keeping all of them. Just keep. So the one thing would be just ignore those which which are likely to have ambiguities. Just don't insert them at all, and just only insert them which give me the right solution. That's actually one way. It's probably related to what you say, which was kind of the standard technique for years. Say, if I'm not certain about 
I simply don't add anything to my graph because every wrong decision may results in a big, typically in, in a disaster. So it's better to not do some of the data decisions if I'm not certain and stick with the rest. If I have enough other constraints, that's fine, but that's always the case. But there's actually a much simpler solution um, to what we are talking about. Let's say we want, you want to do the minimal number of changes to your code. You have your you optimized what you do in your exercises. You have that system and with a minimum number of changes of, of your code, you want to actually be able to deal with multimodal constraints. What would be what would be the easiest way to do that? Okay, so I propose that the easiest way to do that is simply have a constraint which doesn't represent a Gaussian distribution but a sum of Gaussians. Right? So you have a sum of Gaussians instead of one single Gaussian, you have a sum over one, two, three, four, five n Gaussians, and simply say, okay, this edge is now a multimodal edge which has simply a weighted sum of Gaussians. So this would result in the, in the situation that, given this was our constraint before, so the Gaussian that an, that an edge was modeling before, so it was kind of the squared error term over here, we just change that into, we have simply a weighted sum of k okay Gaussians. So this is just a weighing term so that they sum up to one. So we simply, simply take a sum of Gaussians for every edge. So if we have, so to say, then um, we want to do optimization, we want to fill our H matrix, we simply have main weighted terms in there. What the problem with this strategy? Why can I not directly use that? Maybe that's a reason why you haven't thought about this solution so far. How do you find mean here? How do we find what the mean of this? The, the so it's simply a multimodal distribution. So we have a mean for the individual Gaussians, we say, Say with 20% probability is this Gaussian, with 50% this Gaussian, 30% third Gaussian. So multimodal sum of Gaussian. Is, is that similar to saying this is 20% connected to this edge and uh, to this node and 30% connected to this node? And so it's kind of the way it's yes. So simply what you do is you specify a probability distribution, and the less certain you are that this is the right one, simply is a weighing term of your Gaussian. Yeah, yeah. But what about the problem? Let's say you want to plug this into your optimization framework. What's the problem? Well, you don't know the weights. Yeah, that's one thing that could be the case. But given that we say, okay, that we have no preference to say it's either A or B, we just make one divided by M. So one divided by K in this case. Same so weight. The same weight for all of them. Yeah. Because let's say we have a scan matrix just says, I'm either here or here. Say 50% there, 50% there. But what's mathematically the problem if I want to plug this into my optimization framework? Which error will I try to minimize or maximize? What do we try to maximize? Sorry. So, do I operate exactly on this function in my optimization? No. no. Which function do I operate on? On the distance squared or on, on the distance squared over here. Yeah. This was a log likelihood. Yeah. Yeah. What's the problem with the log likelihood in this term? When you have a sum, so you can't. Exactly. So the main problem is this sum over here. Because if you have that sum, you can't simply, or you can still compute the log likelihood, but the term doesn't simplify. So whereas the log likelihood was of negative log likelihood of this term over here, this is what the arrow we tried to minimize. If you do that down here, we simply can't move the log into the sum. So we still have this rather complex term here, which is we cannot handle that easily. Okay, so if you think about the Gaussians, the sum of Gaussians, let's say let's go to the uh, one-dimensional case. Um, so P of x is x. Let's say this is the Gaussian for the first mode for one data association and the mode for a second data association, for example. And this, at least in the right way, would be expressed by the sum from 1 to 2 over, let's say, uh, I, this Gaussian corresponding to um, over x and then u, u, i. The weighting term, let's say, assume they are at the same weight. Um, 
can you find an approximation of this, of this distribution, which is not the same, but <coughs> which looks very similar to what I've drawn, but we don't have that problem with the sum that you can't move the lock into the sum. Sorry? Is it Fourier transform? The Gaussian stays the same, and the sum becomes uh, cross correlations. Or we can here say, uh, so I'm, I'm not sure. I've never heard about that solution, so I can't tell you <laughs> it doesn't work because of that. I don't, I don't know, but um, let's go for a really simple solution. Okay, what happens if instead of the sum, you just use the max operator? That means it would stay here, more or less exactly in that distribution. Here where the distributions overlap, you just take the maximum of those two functions and not the sum. And then going over here, we would end up with the second mode. So the function that we would get would be pretty similar to this one, except in this small area would be slightly different. The advantage of the max operator is, as you know from the error minimization or maximizing log likelihood, um, it can move the, the log with any operator or min operator. And that's actually exactly the way which was done. Therefore, this is called, for it's also called max mixtures. Instead of taking the sum of the Gaussian, you take the max of the Gaussian. So you simply say, hey, instead of that, having that sum over here, just approximate it by a max operator. I just take the mode which gives me the highest probability for position X. So um, if I'm here in this area, I will take this Gaussian, here in the overlapping area, I will switch and then take the second Gaussian. Clearly, if these Gaussians overlap strongly, this will lead to approximation errors. But you could argue that, especially in situations where you do have different um, data stations that say, I'm either in this room or in that room. These gas, they're rather peaked and quite separated from each other. So the problem may not be that dramatic. And the advantage is if I move to this max formulation, I can actually move the lock inside that function and then don't have any problems. It's Except here, if we do the max operator, it means we choose the Gaussian with more peak. And for, for any position in x, you choose the one with the highest mode. So for the power situation here, if x is here, you choose this Gaussian. If the x is here, you choose this Gaussian. Okay, and this is how the approximation looks like. So if these are our two Gaussians, they overlap quite a little bit over here. So this is the overlap area. This is what the max mixture would report, and this is what the sum of Gaussians would report. So you clearly see here in this overlapping area, so around zero, they differ quite significantly, but anywhere else, the difference is rather small. So you may argue, especially if you have modes which are quite far away from each other in space, so where there's no overlap or a small overlap, the approximation error is pretty small. And the advantage if I go for that, if I compute the negative block likelihood, I actually end up with this term over here that I know quite well how to handle that term. Right? This is exactly the term. And the only thing I need to do is actually I have to evaluate my error components for all the for all k. So given my current initial guess, I iterate over all errors and simply select the one which has the highest error, and then or smallest, depending, and then um, select the the term that I need. So the one which is the highest probability. So it can be the nice thing is it can be very easily integrated into your optimizing framework that you have. In the end, and when, you, when you iterate over all the constraints, the only thing that you need to do is enter a small for loop, which iterates over all the modes, select the maximum, and then continue. Right. So it's really, really straightforward and easy to implement. So what you need to do is, is that you evaluate over all k components, you select the one with the maximum value, and then you perform the optimization just by addressing this a maximum component. So you ignore all the other components. You protect what the max operator does. So if you go for that, 
what you see here on top is the standard least squares approach. And what you see here on the bottom is the max mixture approach. And you can actually perfectly see, even if you add, in this case, kind of 100 of these multimodal constraints or even error constraints, the system stays in a very good shape. So the map, the overall map, or the configuration of the nodes is basically identical compared to this situation. The other thing you may ask yourself, yeah, it's nice, but how does this change the runtime of my approach? And actually, the nice thing is it basically does not change the runtime of your approach. I don't want to say at all, but only to a very limited degree. Because the only thing you need to do is you need to iterate, you have to evaluate a few more error terms in order to commit on the model that you're, that you're um, looking into. So, um, so this is the runtime of the kind of normal approach shown in blue, and the max mixture approach. Actually, you see, so it's a, it's a little bit higher. So you get results from that you need to evaluate more error terms. You have to iterate over all modes. But the error, uh, the, the, the runtime doesn't change substantially. Yes, please. Those error modes, I mean, the, the index number is k. Yeah, so it, 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 for every constraint, you need to iterate over all k's in order to evaluate which component is the one you They seeing. came from your data association? Or yeah, this came from your data association from the front end, which says, my current location has been either in that room over there or that room over there, which I've seen before. So we don't know that. So I get this multi -mode. The nice thing is that this technique can also be used very elegantly for outlier rejection. If you don't have the situation that you say, I'm either there or there, you say, I think I'm there, but I know, let's say, it was 1% chance, I simply make an error. How can I easily integrate something like that into this max mixture framework? And can you just throw out all values that after, I mean, uh, you can throw out all, all the associations that don't have a high enough probability? Um, that could make it pretty, pretty complex if you think after of optimization. covering the whole or Maybe I misunderstood you. No, no. After optimization, um, or actually before optimization, you go through for each node that has multiple um, associations. Yeah. Um, throw out the least. Yeah, of course. Yeah, like this is not what I mean. So if you, um, maybe I hadn't expressed that correctly. Um, so I'm talking now to a situation where, where your front end, for example, cannot report your multimodal beliefs. Just gives you, I'm there, or I don't know. But in the decision, I'm there, it simply has, let's say, 1% chance of chance of making a mistake. And the other thing is you can use the max mixture framework to also handle this situation where you say, I'm either here or simply I don't know, in a quite nice way. You, you simply have your one mode, let's say, this is where I am, and the other mode, Simply a Gaussian with more than infinite um, uncertainty, so an information that is close to zero, which you can see is a very, very flat Gaussian. So it's either I'm here or I'm anywhere else, more or less the same distribution. So it's quite an elegant way for doing that. So if you, so this is, for example, um, the way you could model that. So this is the what your what your front end reports to say I'm there around zero zero zero. <laughs> But maybe with a certain probability, I simply made an error at this super flat Gaussian over here. So, if I'm, for example, here very far away from that mode, the system will be actually a blue curve. So, it gives me kind of a small penalty because it's a very flat Gaussian. And this corresponds to the fact that this was actually an outlier. Or I'm here in this area around zero, which would mean that the system did the correct data association. They can still do the same for the. Um, Multimodal belief the same. I'm either in here x equals minus 10 or I'm in x equals 10, and I still can have this blue component. So saying maybe none of those is correct. And you can actually also use that not only in the um, for for the uh, observations to use this information. I could use also use it for my geometry information if. I, for example, have a wheels which may slip. Whenever the wheels slip, it can slip all the time, and um, through the system simply doesn't move. So you could also come up with something like the robot simply slipped, so the wheel slipped and the robot didn't draw forward. Also, the user was executing, or the robot was executing a command, or it drove correctly forward, which is the red. So it's kind of a nice, elegant way for handling typical errors that can occur in terms of wrong data associations. 
maybe multimodal beliefs. Also, this doesn't happen that often. Can happen depending on the central setup you have. And odometry, let's say fatal odometry errors, or dramatic odometry errors, like complete slippage. Could be nice to handle. Um, why should it be? Gaussian for the null hypothesis shouldn't be, it be just some I don't know uniform value. Like you could go for uniform distribution. The nice advantage is if you go for the Gaussian, you don't need to change anything in your optimization framework because what's done for Gaussian. Oh. And if you let's say push your information matrix towards zero, not exactly zero, but towards zero, uh, gives you a very very flat Gaussian. But it's in general you're right. So um, you can also use here um, kind of a uniform distribution of all possible transformations. And yeah, in the, the second case, like. It doesn't really make sense. Why? Why should it be Gaussian in this? Yeah, thing? I completely agree with you that um, that should be done. So I mean, here typically this this blue Gaussian even has a higher is even flatter. It's just for illustration. Yeah, otherwise it's more or less on the bottom line. But um, but but in theory you're completely right. So from the from the kind of modeling point of view, you would probably prefer to have uniform distribution over here. Um, but just for simplicity, for the optimization, you keep the Gaussian. You can also argue that perhaps a uniform distribution doesn't make sense because you assume that you're not completely teleported on the other side of the Earth. You still stay kind of, kind of locally. So you could even argue that the, the very flat Gaussian is not too stupid um, compared to the uniform distribution where it could be, let's say, teleported. The robot's driving around in one point in time is teleported to Australia. It's quite unlikely. Okay, so um, the um, max mixture or this max mixture right here can be either you can be used for um, multimodal constraint, I mean ambiguities in my data association, so the A central data association. And it's also quite a handy tool when you deal with outliers. So of course you don't need to change a lot in your code. You can handle most of the outlier situations quite elegantly. Okay, so this is one example of one of these data sets I think you've seen so far. It's kind of a data set that's um, used quite often. It's a, it's a kind of a, or you have a virtual robot moving on a sphere, getting observations, and um, it's kind of nice for these three optimizations because you have all the angles involved, so you have even singularities, and you can also nicely visualize that you still um, obtain after optimization this kind of sphere shape. And, um, so this is kind of standard Gauss Newton. Here you have a single outlier constraint. You see, oh, it's a little bit. What we should see from there. So the sphere is a little bit deformed, a little bit flatter. You can see some of the constraints here don't look nice. Where in this multimodal um, Gauss Newton variant, um, where you use this multimodal constraints, you don't suffer from that. Um, if you now increase the number of outliers, so we offer ten outliers, it's already hard to see that this here is sphere. You can even take that to the extreme and just add 100 um, outliers. And even 100 is comparably small to the number of nodes in here. There are a few thousand, a few thousand nodes in that sphere. You just add 100 outliers. And so you can't detect or you can't recognize this as a sphere anymore if you don't take into account the situation that you may have outliers. OK, is there any questions so far about what I told you? So let's have a little bit, a little bit, or have a look to what does it kind of mean mathematically, from, or from the optimization point of view, what we are doing here, especially if you want to deal with outliers. So what you see here is the standard Gaussian distribution, and you have kind of the one, two, three, four, five sigma indicators here, and what you may know from minus two sigma to two sigma, um, you have a certain amount of probability math that is in here, which corresponds to approximately ninety-five percent probability mass sits between plus and minus two sigma. Um, and if you go for three sigma, it's around 99%. It means nine, in 99% of the cases, um, the, the, the configuration of the node or the transformation in this case would lie with the three sigma bar. And if you now say, okay, let's say 1% or 2% or 5% of my, um, of my data stations lie outside that, uh, that interval. It simply means that the Gaussian um, approaches zero too quickly. So you need more probability math in these, we call them tails. 
So if you replace the Gaussian with a different distribution, what you typically want to achieve to, to be kind of robust to outliers is kind of more heavy tails. So you have more probability mass pushed towards the tails of this distribution. That's what it kind of um, means mathematically. And um, there is one way to also approach this um, directly. So not going for this max mixture approach, but an alternative view, which comes more from the um, error minimization um, community or math community, numerics, that you replace your probability density function um, with the Gaussian, the function which has more heavy tails. So there's more probability math in the tails. And um, one way to model that how it's often modeled use kind of this row function, row of the error. And um, you simply have an additional function which, which sits here in your, ex, in your, in your expression function. Can be, um, you can use this, so if you said row to e squared or e squared divided by two, you would have a Gaussian distribution. But you may use other functions here which kind of change, change the shape of your distribution. So your minimization is then you simply minimize the sum, so these are all the constraints, all error functions you have um, of the individual error terms. So if you go for the Gaussian distribution, this is kind of a quadratic function. So rho could be quadratic function. There are other approaches you could use. For example, you can use the absolute values for that. You simply take the absolute value of e and not the square value. Or you can take something which is called the Hoover error estimator. Um, the idea is here, in an, in an area around the, um, so um, at the minimum of this constraint, you have a quadratic function. But if you go outside a certain constant c, it turns into a linear function. So you have a quadratic function at some point in time, <coughs> you change it into a linear function. That having an outlier, still you still get a, a, a kind of negative reward for that. But it's not a quadratic penalty you get. It's just linear. That it doesn't corrupt your whole system. And there are several other ways of functions that you that you may observe, or these row functions that you can use in optimization frameworks to appropriately deal with outliers. So this is just an evaluation of this, or an illustration of the super function. So you have a quadratic function here uh, between whatever zero and one, approximately. So here it's quadratic, and then it turns into a linear function. That's exactly what you get from this function. And this uh, constant c simply tells you at which point does the quadratic function turn into a linear function. There's kind of one standard choice for those optimization problems um, to use uh, this kind of uh, <coughs> estimator function, of row function, in order to avoid that a single or very few outliers corrupt your whole solution. And there are, as I said, tons of other functions that you can use. So this is kind of the L1 norm. The absolute value. This is the function that we had, which turned into a um, uh, periodic function, a linear function, the Taki error function. You have things like the Cauchy distribution, the Blake Sisserman kernel, or it's called the corrupted Gaussian, uh, which roughly looks like this. And depending on the optimization problem you're tackling, um, or the properties of your sensor, you may use one of those uh, error functions um, in order to plug them into the optimization. <coughs> If you put that into your optimization framework, you still need to change it a little bit because you need to be able to compute the gradient of, or the Jacobian of this function. For most of them, this exists, or can be split up like for the Hooper. In one case, you have uh, the quadratic function, so you know how to derive that, or it's a linear function, you also know how to derive that, so you have an if then else statement if you're inside this interval C or outside, you can compute a different Jacobian, and it, you end up with having one or two additional terms by setting up your H matrix. Um, but kind of the overall idea stays more or less the same. You can also compare the max mixture approach to this corrupted Gaussian. It turns out that the max mixture is pretty similar to a corrupted Gaussian. So the blue one here is this corrupted Gaussian function, and the red one the max mixture approach. So uh, it seems that this max mixture is actually very similar to this, uh, to the corrupted Gaussian, except that you can still have the possibility to have multiple modes in there. But you can also add multiple modes for this corrupted Gaussian, but then you again in a very, very similar situation. So this max mixture approach that's been recently proposed is quite similar to a corrupted Gaussian, but still has this kind of elegant way of being able to handle multiple modes, which is kind of attractive if your 
um, optimization or your front end of your mapping system actually provides you this multimodal information. I'm either there or there, so you don't know it. Any questions about that? You all can see any questions. Sorry. Yeah. You uh, go ahead. <laughs> That's why I'm here for. Uh, the error we discuss yeah. here is comes from the expected observation, the yeah. observation, and then we last session we talked about two kind of errors, maybe the transition error or the orientation error. And uh, we said maybe we have only error in the or orientation. Uh, where is the robot look like related to the position of the landmarks, if I'm not mixing. And another one, we only discussed the transition error. Um, uh, I mean, here you, have we have, you have to get an error on your transformation yeah, between nodes. Yeah. And so this can be, this is a six-dimensional six co uh, configuration transformation, which consists of three, tra three translations and three rotations. Of course, you can have an error on the orientation, you can have an error on the translation, um, but this all kind of accumulates, so to say, to an error in your, uh, in your transformation. And one part is linear, this, this can be expressed in a linear way, some parts cannot, equations, clearly non linear function. But I um, mm, don't fully understand yeah, I, 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 what's I just want to say we generally consider whole error we have. We don't specify it exactly which is the orientation or. I know we don't specify. I mean, you, you have a sixty, you have a sixty vector which describes your transformation. That's what your measurement, the measurement provides you. the virtual measurement if you look at the post graph yeah. um, situation. And so you need to, you, need, you want to find the configuration of the nodes so that the error that is introduced by these transformations is minimized. And what we did in the standard Gauss Newton approach is we took the Squared error function. So we look into what the we look just look to the individual dimensions and look try to minimize the squared error. And if you uh, if you use a different row function here, it simply means you don't take the squared error. Because the absolute error is a square around the minimum and linear outside and whatever other also Gaussian light and then uh, towards a constant. And it simply means that you transform your error under one of those functions which give you your, your penalty. Does this answer your question? Yeah. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think. Okay, okay so um, let's just remember what, is what, I, what I just said. So of your, of the cost function you use of your robust kernel or robust estimator um, strongly depends on the problem that you're going to address on your sensor, what the properties of your sensor. Is it likely that you're either you're quite close to the solution or you're arbitrarily far off than something which is kind of more or less uniform outside the, the, the center may be a good choice. This simply depends on the problem at hand that you're using. And um, these, the maximizer approach was one way which kind of originated from the idea of allowing for multi multimodal constraints, and then it turned out that it's also quite useful for dealing with outliers. And if you, especially in this case where you have one mode and out and the second mode for outliers, it turns out to be very similar to this um, corrupted Gaussian uh, cost function. And you can also combine the max mixture approach, plus with, for, for example, with other functions like the Hooper cost function, you can even use combinations of those. And so, um, the key idea why this was introduced to be more robust in the optimization, even if your front end makes mistakes. Um, and the key idea of this approach I presented here, the max mixture approach, was to re replace the sum of Gaussian with a mixture, mixture of Gaussian, uh, the, sorry, the sum of Gaussian with uh, the max operator, so you just select the Gaussian which for a certain x location has the highest probability, because this then allows you to move the log inside the max operator you can't move inside the sum, and this brings it into a form which is suitable for our optimization framework. So we can use our um, Gaussian approach here and um, still uh, just, just add a small for loop and an if-then-else statement in that loop in order to select which component we use and then proceed with our standard optimization approach. So there are minimal code changes while having a minimal um, increase in runtime and 
don't need to change a lot and still have the possibility to deal with multi modal beliefs as well as um, outliers in the data association. So therefore, it's kind of quite attractive approach, and um, it's always some, also something uh, you will have to look at in the next exercise and kind of modify the framework you built so far to integrate the Max Mixture approach versus kind of easily integrate it and really boost the robustness of this approach. It's actually a pretty novel approach, so it was first to do this summer uh, at RSS, um, and just the, so it's really up to date work um, by Edwin Olsen and Patrick Agarwal, um, and we did find the corresponding literature on the website, as always, in PDF file of their work. So it's actually something which is really novel and was kind of known since 10 years, something truly really came up last year or the last month. Okay, about this topic, are there any questions so far? Good, so then we'll make a five minute break and then continue with again an alternative approach to all these optimization and then kind of finish with the optimization um, today. Next week, we'll to look into front ends, so we make the data association, and then uh, last week, the summary is discussing evaluation and then this is actually Okay, thanks.